A few years ago, there was some controversy in the social media world because uh, an internet sleuth noticed that there was a theme that was going on in the Instagram top influencers post. Over the course of several months, they noticed that different influencers all from LA had posted pictures of themselves sitting in private jets using hashtags like jet life and private jet. But this one person noticed that something was really off about all the pictures. And so they started to do a little bit of investigating and they realized that every single one of the pictures was taken from the same spot in the same jet. Then after doing some digging, they found the company that owned the jet. They called the number on the website and they learned that it was all fake. It was just completely fake. The jet was not able to fly anymore. It was decommissioned. And so you could call this number and for $150 to $500, you could have a photo shoot in and around the grounded jet, post it to Instagram and make all of your followers go crazy. Now, for those of you who know anything about the internet, this probably doesn't shock you, right? Uh, This is what social media is all about. It's showing others the version of yourself that you want people to see. It's showing everybody the put together version, the happy version, the successful version, but it's anything but real. The thing though is it's not just social media. We do this at home, at work, and at church because we are afraid that if people saw who we really are, they wouldn't want to be in our lives anymore. Right? We do this because we believe that people will think that we are not good enough, that we are too broken, that our past is too shameful, and that our present is too messy. And so what do we do? Right, we fake it. We pretend to be someone we're not. We create barriers between us and the people in our life, and then we paint a facade on the front of it that makes, look, makes everything look better than it really is. And if we are being honest with ourselves, we would say that this is exhausting. Right, you don't need to raise your hand for this, but how many of you are tired of pretending like you have it all together? Right, how many of you are worn out because there are things in your life that you are hiding, and it takes everything in you to keep them hidden? How many, many of you wish you could be real about your sin and your pain and your hopes and your dreams, but you are too afraid to be vulnerable because with vulnerability comes the risk of getting hurt? Right now, we're in this series called Bloodstained Pews, and this series is all about getting real. It's about how vulnerability can transform a broken church into a church for the broken. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all of you who have leaned in, who are really embracing this series, because I've heard some incredible things coming out of the last few weeks. After last week's sermon, someone went home. Uh, They deleted all their social media because they knew that it was leading them down a path they didn't want to be going down when it came to the images that they were seeking out. I heard another story about a person who, after being in a small group here at Collective for about two years, for the first time ever shared anything. And they finally opened up about their struggle with mental health. I had a conversation with someone who told me that they have felt anger and resentment toward the church for years. But this series has helped them realize that their past church hurt, while valid, doesn't impact how they can worship here. And I love hearing these stories because we want to be a church of bloodstained pews. We want Collective to be a place where if you are hurting, if you are struggling, if you feel lost, you don't have to pretend like everything is okay. Because ultimately, this is a church where you can bleed and you can heal. But that can only happen when we choose vulnerability. And when we choose to get real about what is going on in our lives and how we need Jesus to help us. And so today we're going to keep moving forward in this journey and we're going to get real about growth. Author Stephen Covey wrote in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, that successful people begin with the end in mind, meaning they see what they want and what they'll do is they'll reverse engineer their life to get there. This is the athlete who wants to win a gold medal, so they spend years putting in the hard work and competing. It's the aspiring musician who wants to tour the country playing all of the songs that they've written. So they begin by learning the basics of music. It's a student who dreams of being a doctor and so they study every single day so they can get into a college that best sets themselves up for med school. And it's the Christian who wants to have a marriage and a family and friends and purpose and joy that following Jesus offers. So they start by putting the spiritual habits in today that help them get there. And so that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're going to begin with the end in mind, and we're going to start by reading a famous passage that we probably read here at Collective multiple times a year. And then what we're going to do is we're going to look at what steps we need to take in our growth to get to this end point. 
And we're going to start in Matthew 7, verse 24. And Jesus says this. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the wind beats against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you want to build a life that can withstand the storms, it needs to have the right foundation. And he says that that foundation comes from listening to and trusting him. I don't know if you've been following along with what's going on in the Outer Banks right now, but in the city of Rodanthe, nine homes have been swept out to sea in the past four years. It is absolutely unreal. Uh, I'll also say, I like weirdly like watching videos of houses getting taken on, but I don't really know why. But like this idea that this house is floating in the ocean, it's just fascinating. Also, that's not a person on the porch. Everyone thinks it is. It's not. It's just stuff. But this is a real house that is floating in the ocean. And this is what Jesus compares lives to that are built on the wrong foundation, right? This is what a life that is built on culture looks like. This is what a life that's built on whatever we want looks like. And none of us want this for our life, right? Right? None of us want storms to take us out. We don't want this in our marriages. We don't want this in our mental health. We don't want this in our faith, right? We want to build a house that can withstand the storms. And so what we have to do is we have to reverse engineer it. And so to do that, I'm going to give us three things today that we need to grow in if we are going to withstand the storms of life. Because what Jesus just said about building our lives on the bedrock comes from the end. It's the conclusion to his most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And if that's how he ends this sermon, we need to know what Jesus said before this. We need to know the steps that he has given us so that we can build our house on a strong foundation. The Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew 5, and it begins with a bunch of blessings But then Jesus goes into this section where he says the same two phrases over and over again. He says, you have heard that our ancestors were told, and you have heard what the law says. And when Jesus says these two phrases, what he's doing is he's reminding this crowd, you all know what the Bible says. You all know what God said in the Old Testament. But then in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus continues. He says, I want to clarify what God means about lust and anger and how to treat your enemies and a ton of other things. And so Jesus starts off the Sermon on the Mount by saying, here is God's word, and here's how you live it out. And so what is Jesus teaching us from this? If we want to grow so we can have a strong foundation, we have to read the Bible. If you were to sum up Matthew chapter 5, that is what this means, read the Bible. At the beginning of the year, we did a series called 35, and one of the challenges was to read the Bible every day for 35 days straight. And there are people at Collective who had never owned a Bible before. They went out to Next Steps and they grabbed one. They downloaded the YouVersion app and they started reading the Bible for the first time because of that challenge. There are people at Collective who owned a Bible. Maybe they had the Bible app on their phones, but they never really read it before. And there are people who have read the Bible over 200 days this year. But here's the thing that really blows me away. There are people at Collective who have read their Bible 273 days in a row which means they started on January 1st and they haven't missed a day yet, which is incredible. I want to share some data with you that uh, I absolutely love. It comes from the Center for Bible Engagement. um, And I I think you're going to want to take a picture of this. So if you don't have your phone out, get out your phone. Uh, If you don't take notes on anything else this morning, you'll want to take notes on this. Take pictures of the four slides I'm about to put up. But before I show you those slides... Right? If you are a part of Collective, you know the conversations that you're always having about yourself and the people around you that go like this. Right? How can we help each other battle addiction? How, how do we help each other fight pornography? How can I help my friend who's struggling with depression or the person in my life who won't forgive? How can I deal with my bitterness and my loneliness? How do we motivate people in this community to share their faith? Or, or how do we encourage people to give financially? How do we stop feeling spiritually stagnant? Well, the data says if you read your Bible only four times per week, here's what happens. Reading the Bible four times per week decreases your odds of giving into these temptations. Drinking to excess, viewing pornography, having sex outside of marriage, gambling, lashing out in anger, gossiping, neglecting family, overeating or mishandling food, and mishandling money. And here's what I think when I see this. 
Right? Some of us, we could pick any single topic we want from that slide. And some of us are so focused on what we need to stop doing. And so we just sit and we have these thoughts in our mind. I need to stop sleeping around. I need to stop coping through drugs and alcohol. I need to stop abusing money, whatever it is. And some of us are so consumed by what we need to stop doing that we don't actually do anything to stop doing the things that we need to stop doing. And so maybe, maybe if we struggle with one of the things on this list, instead of focusing on what we don't want to do, what if we focused on what God and his word have to say and leaning into that? What if we focused on what we can do and we can see how that impacts our lives? Because reading the Bible just four times a week, it can lead to these types of temptations disappearing from our life. And I want to take a quick aside for a second um, to challenge those of you who have been at Collective for a few years. Because if you've been here for a few years, you, you've seen these before. My guess is if you opened up your phone right now and scrolled back about 18 months, you'd be like, oh crap, I took four pictures of those last time. But for those of you who are struggling with any of the things on this list, but have been trying to figure out how to remove these temptations from your life in some other way than starting with scripture, I just want to know how's that going for you? And I'm not asking that to be rude. I'm genuinely asking, is whatever else you are trying working? And if it isn't, or it isn't working in the way that you actually need it to, don't you think it's time to give this a shot? Slide two. Reading the Bible four or more times per week decreases your odds of struggling with these issues. Feeling bitter, thinking destructively about yourself, feeling like you have to hide what you do or feel, having difficulty forgiving others, feeling discouraged, experiencing loneliness, experiencing fear or anxiety. One of the amazing things about this study is that they actually found that whether you believe Jesus or not, right, whether you are a Christian or not, if you are lonely or if you want to hurt yourself if, or if you are entangled in for forgiveness, if you read scripture every single day, the odds of those things will decrease. Slide three, reading the Bible four or more times per week, week gives you significantly higher odds of giving financially to church, memorizing scripture, which makes sense because you're actually reading it. Discipling others, which means helping other people follow Jesus. It raises your odds of sharing your faith with others and giving financially to causes, to things outside of the church, which means reading the Bible makes you generous here and outside of this place. And then slide four. Reading the Bible four more times per week gives you significantly lower odds of feeling spiritually stagnant and feeling like you can't please God. And I've shared these before, and there are different seasons of my life where I, where I think I love different slides in this deck. But right now, I think this is the one that I love the most. Because the thing is, a lot of times we feel distant from God. And we feel far away from God. And we feel like we can't feel God's presence in our lives. But if we just read the Bible, we know he's there. And people who read the Bible four or more times, they don't question whether or not God loves them or he's for them or he's with them, even in the low moments of their life. And so very simply, spend time every day reading the Bible. Four more times, that's it. And see what it can do in your life. Now, let me give you a few Bible tips and tricks to go with that, though. Uh, if you want to learn more about Jesus, I would encourage you to read the book of Luke in the New Testament. While you're reading that, write down every question you have and then get with a person who can answer them. And if you don't have someone in your life that can answer the questions, just come find me on a Sunday and I'll, I'll direct you and help you find somebody who can work through those with you. To connect emotionally with God, read the book of Psalms. To learn about the church, read the book of Acts. To grow in your wisdom, read the book of Proverbs. To really push yourself, try to read the Bible in the entire year. If you fall off track, don't give up. Try to read it in a year and a half. Just don't stop reading it. If you're younger, I would encourage you to get the Action Bible. It's essentially a graphic novel version. It's really cool. For elementary age kids, get the Jesus Storybook Bible. Right? And, and these are just ideas. There's a ton of other ideas out there. But, but here's the thing. If you would say right now that you are struggling with depression or bitterness or addiction, if you feel stagnant in your faith or your family or your career, or you're just trying to grow closer to God, read the Bible every single day so that you can build a foundation on it. Now, moving forward to Matthew 6, uh, Jesus gets a little bit punchy here. He throws some haymakers. And, and here's what I mean by that. In just 34 verses, Jesus talks about humility, prayer, fasting, generosity, idolatry, forgiving others, and worry. Jesus says things like this in Matthew 6, 14. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. 
Matthew 6, 19, he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And then he concludes Matthew 6 by saying, so don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. If I had a sum of everything Jesus says in Matthew 6, it would be this, do the hard thing. And really that's true for the entire Sermon on the Mount. But, but specifically for what he's saying here, because what he's asking us to do is hard stuff. It's forgiving others. It's trusting God with our money. It's not worrying about tomorrow. It's removing something from our life so we can spend more time with God. It's being disciplined in prayer. It's doing the hard thing. Researchers at Cal Berkeley once did an experiment that involved introducing an amoeba into a perfectly stress-free environment. It had the ideal temperature, it had the optimal concentration of moisture, it had a constant food supply. And their belief is if they could create this perfect environment without any challenge, without any stress, the amoeba would thrive, right? It would thrive, it would do what amoebas do, it would grow, multiply, all those things. But guess what happened to the amoeba? It died. And that is because we need challenge in order to survive. We need challenge in order to grow. And some of you feel like you are not growing in your faith. And it's probably because you're refusing to do that hard thing that God is asking you to do. Right? And I don't even need to give you a list of hard things right now because deep down inside, I think you know what God is asking you to do. But I'm going to do it anyway. Right? Do the hard thing and forgive your parents so you can move on without bitterness ruling your life. Do the hard thing and trust that God will take care of you and stop worrying about those things that are out of your control. Do the hard thing and prioritize spending time with God in prayer. Do the hard thing and remove yourself from that unhealthy relationship. Do the hard thing and read your Bible every day. Do the hard thing and finally open up about your struggles with the Christian friends that you are closest to. Do the hard thing. Get baptized. Do the hard thing. Start serving others so your faith isn't selfish and just about you. Men, do the hard thing and go to crucible. We talk about this multiple times a year. Men, do the hard thing so you can start working on your shadow that's slowly been destroying your life. Right? They, we have two weekends coming up, November 1st through 3rd, January 10th through 12th. You can go to either one of them. We don't really care. Just go to one. Right? And if you were trying to figure out which one's best, you can go to both. I would say January 10th through 12th. We have a lot of men in this church who are going to staff that weekend, and it just creates a really great experience. And every time we talk about this, we say the same thing. If you cannot afford it, you come and talk to us, and we'll help you get there. But for two years, we've been talking about this. And for two years, I've been challenging the men of this church. And for two years, you've been saying, that's too hard. Do the hard thing. Right? We have to read our Bibles. We have to do the hard thing that God is asking us to do. Then the last section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about how we should treat others. And he sums it all up by saying this in Matthew 7, starting in verse 17. He says, a good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. Sometimes I think Jesus is like, they're idiots. I need to explain this to them. I'm reading that. I'm like, oh, like I get this. He continues. He says, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. In other words, be a person where what you see is what you get. And yes, that means that we need to grow in our integrity. But it also means being real on the outside when it comes to what's going on on the inside. And so for this week, I'll I'll sum it up like this. Be real. Be real. Some of us are trying to produce good fruit on the outside, but we are so jacked up on the inside that it's not possible. And so we have to be real about our struggles and our brokenness and our doubts, and we have to bring them out in the open so that Jesus can get to work. I was very much a lost person. I... I've hit rock bottom a lot and I wish I hadn't. I wish I would have done things the easy way. I, and I started when I was younger, I, you know, the way I coped with certain things, I started when I was younger with either self harm or cutting and that developed into drug abuse and alcohol abuse. And, and, you know, I looked at self-destruction as a, Hey, I'm just take, I'm just hurting myself. I'm not hurting anybody else. I've never really felt like I belonged in a traditional church. I, I either, you know, I, I stepped away from the church for a long time. I stepped away from God. I said, if Christians are like this, then I don't want to be part of this church. 
I did my own, I did my own thing for, for 15 years. I, you know, I did a lot of good things. I, you know, successful in sports and school and made a lot of friends and I, you know, I've done a lot of things where, you know, the world would say, wow, you're doing a lot of good things, you're successful. And I looked at myself and I, I wasn't happy with where I was at because I had never been vulnerable with who I was as a person. And I felt like I couldn't be vulnerable with people. So, you know, a lot of that is I didn't understand what step I needed to take. I, want, I would want to be a part of something that helps the community. You know, I don't believe in this whole Jesus thing. I don't know who he is. Um, but, you know, if I can be part of an organization that gives back, is bigger than myself, then maybe I'll get something fulfilling out of it. I was, I was friends with Josh Kim, and he did something simple. He just posted something on Facebook. He just said, hey, I'm at the grocery store buyout. And I was like, all right, well, I could get along with Josh Kim, so maybe I'll try out his church. Uh, I, would go, I would hop in the service, and I would, I would show up late and run out as fast as I could. In June 2023, there was a sermon series called Game Changer, and it was a challenge towards men to step up and be men. There's a lot of things that men don't do in today's day and age, and being vulnerable is one of them. I've never really been vulnerable with anybody. Uh, I mean, maybe a handful, I'll give them pieces of myself, but I've never really fully opened up and said, hey, I'm willing to work on certain things. You know, in 2023, when, I, when I'm working through all this stuff, I listen to a sermon and I would immediately run back to my house and either get, uh, just smoke weed or I would drink because I couldn't, I couldn't cope with what was going on on the sermon. And I knew it was just, it was directed towards me. I was like, I knew I gotta be, ch be different. I knew I gotta change. And I looked at myself, I said, you know, I'm giving collective 45 minutes a week. I'm not really giving them a fair shot. I'm meeting people in service and maybe for a couple minutes saying hi, bye. I'm not building actual connections. So am I really giving collective a fair shot? So the first thing I, I did was I joined the team. I joined the breakfast team. It was a huge step for me because I looked at it and said, I am a completely broken person. I'm a shameful person. And I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to make egg casseroles and make people happy. And then they can go tell people about Jesus because I'm not in a place to tell anyone about it. I'm a, I'm a very self-destructive human being. And if I don't channel my my who I am as a person, I'm either going to channel in a sense where it's either destructive or positive, and there's no in between. So I was channeling something where I was doing it in a positive manner, and I was able to give back on a small level, and, it, and but it made a huge impact on my life, honestly. I knew that something was missing. I was successful in a lot of ways, but something was missing. And I still did, I knew something was wrong and it was my body's way of telling me something isn't right. You're not walking in step with what God wants for you. So I checked the baptism box, very appreciative of the team. They, they you know, took their time uh, talking to me. I had a lot of doubts. I came to a realization I needed to accept grace. Uh, and I needed not just accept it, but I needed, I needed God and Jesus to walk with me going forward. This is a chance for me to just accept a gift. And it's, it's not easy to accept a gift. When I got into the tub, I, I was zero days sober. And so I was looking at it, I was like, man, I have to be perfect before I get into uh, baptism. But if I waited to be perfect, I would never get there. <laughs> I was still smoking weed every single day and it was something where I was like, I knew it was wrong. I knew I wasn't doing what I, I should be doing. And I knew it was limiting my growth because I was just numbing the pain constantly rather than emotionally dealing with the problems that I had at hand. So I got baptized in December and January. Pastor Michael says, well, okay, we're going to do a 35 day challenge. You know, do something physical, read, the, read a chapter in the Bible, do a guided prayer, serve someone and sacrifice something. And in that moment, he said, you know what you need to sacrifice. I'm like, well, yeah, I do, okay? So you don't have to rub it in all the time, Michael. But, and so I said, okay, I'm gonna give up weed for 35 days, which I hadn't done for 15 years. I'd been smoking weed every day for 15 years, pretty much. And so as I'm getting close to the 35 days, I'm like, yeah, I can, I can go back and be the same person again. And then CT gets on stage, and then he says, well, what are you gonna do for your next 35 days? 
And I was like, I can't catch a break with these guys. So why am I choosing to be real about my, about my growth? Um, Cause I, I don't want to be in a community where people stay the same. I don't want to be in a community that is like normal churches. Cause I don't like normal churches. I don't get along with normal churches. I want people that are real about their brokenness. Cause I want them to grow like I grew. Yeah, it sucks though. Being vulnerable sucks. There's no way around it. But being vulnerable is, is the only way to heal. It's the only way. And it's not easy. But you can take the small steps and sometimes you just have to take the right next step. Hey, can we give it up for Joel? <laughs> I want to be more like Joel, because when I think of a person right now who's just running after Jesus, and when I think of a person who's building a solid foundation, when I think of a person who's just consistently doing the hard things that God is asking him to do, but more importantly, you know, when I think about a person who is real and raw and vulnerable, it's Joel. Now, here's the struggle, though, when it comes to our church specifically, Right? Because some churches will try to make everything look perfect, but that's not us. Right? We've never had that issue of pretending to be perfect. That's not our struggle. Our struggle is more about faking what we're real about. Right? It's sharing things, but not actually being vulnerable. It's saying something that's honest, but it's not real. In 2022, Balenciaga put out a pair of shoes that cost $1,800. Here's what these shoes look like. Yep. Uh, these are intentionally destroyed sneakers. And I think the temptation in a church like Collective, where we don't put up this shiny facade like we have it all together, our temptation is to look broken. Right? It's to look dirty. We actually have to be real about what's going on. So let me just encourage you, don't, don't share the things that are easy to share. Get dirty for real because it's worth it. So let's recap. Jesus says a storm will come, and in, in order to survive, we have to have a strong foundation. He tells us to read the Bible. He tells us to do the hard things. He tells us to be real. And if you think about it, this is kind of a basic sermon, isn't it? Right? Put some Ugg boots on it, give it a PSL. You know, it's so basic. Right? It's just this simple. Do the foundational things and do the fundamentals to help you grow closer to God. Right? To put him first. And if you are like me, there's part of you that's thinking, can we just move beyond this to something more complicated? But then if you're also like me, you're reminded about storms. And you understand that the reason we do these fundamental things is because you know a storm is coming if it's not already here. And, and there are two things about storms that I know to be true. The first is that we underestimate the size of the storm. If you, if you think back to the video of the house that's floating in the ocean, that house was built on stilts so it could withstand a storm surge. But it just so happens that the surge was bigger than anyone predicted. When you see houses flattened by a tornado, the tornado was just bigger than anyone imagined. When you see buildings leveled by an earthquake, right, they, they knew they were in an earthquake zone. It was just a bigger earthquake than anyone anticipated. Right? We underestimate the size of the storm. And here's the second thing. We overestimate our ability to handle the storm. Whenever a disaster strikes, whether it's floods or wildfires or, or anything else, you always see the story of that person or that family who didn't evacuate and are having to be rescued. Why? Because they thought they were strong enough to endure it. And the thing is, we see this in our life as well. It always seems like the storm is worse than what we imagined. Right? It's addiction level stuff. It's divorce level stuff. It's bankruptcy level stuff. And when the storm hits, we think, I wasn't ready for this, right? When the storm hits, we think, I don't have the relational depth I thought I did. I don't have the spiritual maturity to handle this. I don't have the right foundation. And so listen, please do not overestimate your ability to handle the storm. There's always going to be a storm that's coming, even if you've been through them in the past and even if you're going through them right now. So build your foundation on God and God alone, and start getting real about your growth now so that you can have a fighting chance later. Let's pray. God, it would be so much easier right now just to pray that there are no storms. Um, in fact, I think, God, a lot of us do that. We wake up every day praying, 
that you take the storm away or that you protect us from a future storm. Because God, we don't, we don't want to endure them. God, we don't, we don't want to go through storms. We don't want to experience those things in our lives. But one thing we know is true is that storms come. And God, oftentimes we can't avoid them. A lot of times they're not even brought on by ourselves. But they show up in our lives. And so God, I just pray that when the storm hits, we have a strong foundation. And God, I know there are people in this room right now um, who are on the tail end of something devastating in their life and they realize their foundation wasn't in the right place. They're trying to build that right now. God, we pray that they have the strength and courage to keep going. But God, I also know that there are people in this room that haven't really experienced that storm yet. And my hope and my prayer is right now they start building that foundation. God, they start trusting your word. They start doing the things that you're asking them to do. And they find the courage to open up and be real about the things that they're wrestling with, the things that they're fighting for, the dreams that they have, the highs and the lows. God, we know that life is full of storms. We are so thankful that we don't need to figure out what to build our lives on. We don't have to go around searching for it. We have it right in front of us. It's you and you alone. So God, I just pray that we trust that. We take the steps to continue or to start building our life on your foundation. God, we thank you and love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.